My skin is black. What you oh. looking My at? My skin yeah. is black. I feel so good to be black right now. Is black. <laughs> Welcome to episode 129 of the Black and Fashion Podcast. This is our first recording of 2023, so this is going to be a special one for you guys. Um, I hope everyone had a happy new year and, of course, happy holidays. Um, This new season, um, we definitely are going to make sure that we spot in and make sure that we highlight black fashion professionals um, a little bit more often. We're also going to do this new thing that I would like to call the Black and Fashion News, where we kind of talk about a little bit about current events or talk about different industry events that are coming and that are in the near future so that we are keeping all of our black and fashion community in the know so today i am joined with tiffany hi tiffany hi thanks for joining us so i'm gonna give you guys a little background about tiffany so she uh let me go up a little bit okay so Multi-awarded Shafani, well, she first of all, she owns Shafani Brands. Now, multi-awarded Shafani Brands Unlimited is a first-of-its-kind luxury creative brand specializing in the curation of design established with a mission to uplift, impact, and inspire through the arts. Launched in 2009, uh, Shafani develops or partners with brands and organizations to scale artistic endeavors, offering a fresh perspective and a hybrid of innovative design, quality production and marketing. Services include art and creative direction, film and product design, fashion design, wardrobe styling and tailoring, image consulting and multimedia branding and social strategies. Some notable publications featuring the Shafani Touch include Complex, Hype Beast, Los Angeles Times. Thank you so much Tiffany for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so really so Shafani is the shit. <laughs> <laughs> This is what, I'm like that's what that's what I'm getting from this, okay? Oh wow, Pro- proverbially, um, yeah. I'd say. Um, I mean, we all have to have uh, some type of confidence. So mm-hmm. I actually wrote my own bio. Mm-hmm. Um, as you should, everybody. Yeah. I, you <laughs> I'm like, know? as you should. <laughs> so I'm the I'm the person that knows best. So um, I mean. I'm just the vessel, really. But. Gotcha. So mm-hmm. I always like to do, before I start any interview, a little icebreaker. Mm-hmm. So we're going to play a little game called This or That. Mm-hmm. I feel like I know some of the answers to these questions, too, just like from your get up. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's go with, let me start with something deep. Not even deep, but a funny one. Side mm-hmm. boob or under boob? Um, can I drink? Uh, I don't know. Um... <laughs> um I'm, I like a little of both. Which one? Which one? But um, the way my boobs are, I think a uh, side boob. Side boob. Okay. <laughs> Where's your mule? Um, mule. I prefer I prefer a mule over over a wedge. Gotcha. Right flare leg. Right. Yeah. <laughs> flare leg or skinny leg? Um, flare. All right. Fedora or beret? Um, both. <laughs> Drink. <laughs> I'm like, it's one. <laughs> um, uh, I started out as a kid in, in berets. Gotcha. And studs or hoops? Um, studs. Studs. Okay, cool. All right. So we have what we start off with of is um, it's a muse. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want you to tell me, and we used to do this like at the end of our episodes, but I like to start it in the beginning because I want to figure out where your inspiration comes from and then learn a little bit about your background. Mm-hmm. So if you want to start with just telling us what, how, what is your muse? Um, what is my muse? Yeah. So, so the way I explain it is like, whether it's an affirmation, a quote, somebody that, you know, you know, have been inspiration in your life, a book that you've read, any of those things. Mm-hmm. Um. To whom much is given, much is required and expected. Um, Yeah, that one. That's the one. Um, That's my favorite artist. So, you know, the creator is the ultimate muse. I like that. So, tell me a little bit about your background, where you're from, and when you caught that fashion bug. Hmm. I caught the fashion bug um, straight out the womb. Um, I think that. You know, it's generationally, it's we are a stylish people, mm-hmm. period. And then in my family, we just caught like a, get a little taste extra, you know. So we're the extra camp, mm-hmm. <laughs> extra tribe. Um, so it's just been 
something that trickled down and my mother never was one to impose um, what she wanted me to wear. It was more like what I want to wear. So I would pair boys clothes with girls clothes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And be kind of intersectional with that and she didn't care. Mm -hmm. I like that. Okay. So tell me a little bit about like what your background is as far as like education goes. Were you self-taught? Did you go to school? Did you think school is even necessary to be in the fashion world? Um, Well, I think education is necessary to be um, in any industry. Um, You just can't jump into things. You have to uh, either be an autodidact and be self-taught or, you know, um, go to school and get a formal education. Um, But there are options. You just need to be able to retain education. And as for me, um, I'm an alumni of New Jersey City University, um, which is a state university. I'm from North New Jersey. Um, and I am an alumni of the All Stars Project and a few of other uh, business organizations. And so I learned a lot um, about what it took to push a dream. Um, and so I think it's necessary to get your education. Um, you asked another question, though. In the, in the midst of that question. Uh, actually, what school you went to and if you feel like education was uh, necessary? Um, I will say that I did not go to fashion school. Um, my grandmother is someone who's always sewn. Um, that's also generational. My great-grandmother, um, it didn't hit my mother, but it hit me. And so I've just always sewn my own clothes since I was maybe five. You know, I started having. We have that and, in common. Yeah, that's great. My granny taught me when I was six. It skipped over my mama. My mother was never interested, <laughs> and mm-hmm. I've been sewing since I was six. Wow, it's amazing. Yeah. Yep. So I feel like I found a lot of people that had that. Like their parents didn't necessarily get into it, but the the grandkids. You know, like I feel like probably I have like over one hundred and twenty some episodes. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of people who were like granny taught me. Granny taught me, Mm -hmm. granny taught me. And I find that we're all probably millennials, so we're probably all in like our late 20s, like early, well, late 20s all the way to 40s as millennials. That's that era where like we spent a lot of time with our grandma, Mm -hmm. you know, because mama worked a lot Mm -hmm. and that's what we did Mm -hmm. when we was with granny. Mm -hmm. Granny was sewing, you was sewing. Granny was crocheting, you was crocheting. (laughs) Granny was knitting, you Mm -hmm. was knitting too. (laughs) I'm like, because I'm definitely in crochet so many socks, girl. She used to have me right there. Like, I'm like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to crochet. I don't think I've ever picked up that skill of knitting but um you know hand stitching that's mm. my thing that's what's up mm-hmm. okay so tell me a little bit about the Shafani brand how was it formed I know it was formed back in 2009 but how did it you know how did it come about how did it come together um so it actually came together I was an intern already at the time on Wall Street and so I um, was going to school and doing that and I was also styling as a hobby for some friends um, personal shopping for people um, and then there was an untimely death of my uncle Jerry and he was an artist that nobody knew you know was into art um, and so I said you know I'm not gonna live a life where nobody knows that I actually create um, I'm not really fulfilling what I want to do mm-hmm. so from that point on I started you know a business with Shifani and it started with fashion, tailoring, um, design, um, wardrobe, costuming, all of those things, theater production. Um, It went to TV real fast um, because I was an assistant on a lot of projects. Um, And then it just kind of blossomed over the years. Gotcha, I Mm -hmm. love that. What is your favorite part of the business? Because when you have a service-based business and you offer a lot of different services, it's it's always that one one service, like, I can do that all Mm -hmm. day long, Mm -hmm. all day long. What's that? I would say all of the things that I specialize in because somebody had to actually say, you know, throughout me being or spending time in certain industries or rooms, they would say, oh, you do that too? You know that's a job, right? And then somebody would actually have to tell me, and I'd say, oh, that's a position? Okay, well, then I can do that, too. And I've been doing it since I was five because I was in theater and dance and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, having experience and then also being amongst the people who were in it, Mm -hmm. you know, and getting that hands-on, like, education and experience um, real time. 
Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So I have like uh, one of the things I thought that we should cover that you also thought would be good for interviewing mm-hmm. was to be, you know, all of the non for profit affiliates you, I work with and the fact that you're the youngest Afro Latina. So tell me about some of these non for profit sectors. Um, so I'm the youngest Afro Latina in the world to have done um, the fashion weeks, like all of them. Um, I haven't hit Milan though. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've done Art Basel. And all of these things have been like a thing. Mm-hmm. And so that's a feat in itself. And then as far as the organizations, so everything that I've learned in such a short span of time, I've only been um, around doing what I've wanted to do professionally for like 15 years. So okay. people have been around for 30 years, you know, right. people like Nisa Hilton, you know, um, the GOAT, um, Ruth Carter. Um, all these people. I love Ruth Carter. <laughs> yeah, right? I worked with Misa too. Yeah, tell yes, me I more. Tell me more. She said, "Okay." <laughs> uh, so um, I, I feel like, do you know you? I do the podcast, but you know, I got four other businesses. Oh yeah, tell all me. in the fashion space. <laughs> oh, oh so you enough mean, about me. You don't know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I own a company. It's called LC Apparel Consulting, and we do we offer full service manufacturing and product development for Black designers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's over in. Uh, I own a studio over in Bushwick. Now, Misa, I got in touch with Misa from, I think, somebody I interviewed on this podcast that was in her Stylist Academy mm-hmm. um, that ended up interning with her. Um, so, Misa had me make some pants for Megan Thee Stallion. Um, I also made a suit for uh, Arthur. So, I was her pattern maker to mm-hmm. her go to, like, uh, for, for fast stuff. So, okay. I was like, okay, no, Misa. Like, literally, like, when I tell you two, three-day turnarounds, I had, a, I had a job at that point. Like, I wasn't in full-time entrepreneurship mm-hmm. and, I, and I was a product development director at a lingerie company and girl it must have been slow because I was sitting at my desk making that pattern mm-hmm. for Megan <laughs> Thee Stallion they sent me and it was a, and she had did a partnership with MCM at the time mm-hmm. so it's like MCM you know that leather that stuff don't stretch so I'm trying to figure out how to maneuver this pattern at my little small desk and mm. it was a pair of chat pants girl Ooh, yeah, it was a chap in CM. Like and it. I literally, my desk wasn't probably no bigger than this table. Mm-hmm. And Misa had, well, I think I had like two days. Oh, yeah, then I had a suit that I had gosh. to do in almost like two days, like full on suit. Like, but yeah, she's, she's dope. Oh, yeah, clap like, it up for you. Like, yeah. <laughs> 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 Takes one to know one. Definitely. Okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, about the organization. So, mm-hmm. um, so, I'm a community chair and partner. Um, at Arts at Newark um, is an organization that's built on making sure the children in our communities thrive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm really excited to be a part of that organization um, and, and be a part of their council. And um, the Jerry Gant Art Collection, um, or the Jerry Gant Times Pink Dragon Art Collection. Um, Jerry Gant was the face of North Art, so I'm the collection specialist there. I volunteer my time there. Um, he left over 4,000 plus pieces and shout out to Miss Linda Street because she's like the fashion fairy godmother of Newark. Um, that's period. crazy because that's what they call me here. Really? Yes. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I they love call that. me the fashion fairy godmother. Yes. I love that. We have a lot of them in, in the, the black fashion community. Yes, we do. Shout out to the Jerry Gant Art Estate, Kay the Creator, all the people over there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, those are the organizations that I'm a part of and just happy to be giving back everything that I know and I've learned up until this point mm-hmm. back to the city. We should partner because I own a non profit. It's called the Black Girls Designer Club. Tell me more. Yeah, and we have a brush, Shades of Brown fundraiser brush coming up. It's February 26th. We have mm. our BGDC uh, fundraising gala. It's April the 16th. Mm. We do a fashion summer boot camp. Mm. Um, and so we raise the money to do the boot camp like, for That's the young beautiful. girls. And we offer a mentorship program year round mm-hmm. for girls ages 6 to 22, and it's free. That's beautiful. I and we have been looking, like, we had a meeting last night. We've been looking for more mentors. Yeah, I'd love we to. We want more speak. mentors because we have girls everywhere. They're not just in New York. We have people in Houston. We have people in Baltimore, mm-hmm. New York, stuff like that. So it would be great to have a I mentor that's based that. in Jersey because I have, we have a lot of mentees in Jersey as well. I so love that. That would be yeah. dope if you could, if you want to come on board, girl, we can use another hand. Yes, I'm right there in the bricks. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, we could definitely use some more mentors because I feel like, and this is we're talking about that not for profit space. I think that it's harder to get people to stay committed mm-hmm. to it because it doesn't have a dollar sign attached mm-hmm. to it. And that's where I found that that has been the hardest. Versus like getting people to stay engaged. Like I feel like people come, 
you know, they'll come to our events, stuff like that. They'll donate and stuff like that. But as far as, like, we need your time when it comes to the kids. Mm -hmm. Like, in order to do it. So, like, we, like, our mentors, it's like four of us is actually active. We stacked with kids, mm -hmm. you know. And it's a lot, you know, and it could be overwhelming. We wouldn't trade it for the world. But it's like, it's, it seems like it's some people, they act like they want to be involved. Mm -hmm. But because there's no price point and there's no money coming from it. They come and they, then they leave mm -hmm. or whatever. No, they don't yeah. come at all. Or they don't come. <laughs> <laughs> they say oh. it. They talk a good game. And I'm like. This is it's a not for profit. Yeah. Like it requires your time. It requires time to be putting it that outreach is be there so you know, but that's what it's really about is like giving your time, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. We have um an organization called Brick, Brick City Stitch. Um, I don't know the lady's name that runs the organization, but I've seen her stuff. Mm -hmm. So that would probably be the best way to partner in the city. Mm -hmm. Um there are a lot of um, you know, after school organizations that have those types of things. And then we also have North Public Library, um, their maker space. Um, I do work out of, you could always host, a, you know, a community day and say, hey, this is my organization, my nonprofit. We, we want to bring people in, mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing. And they're open to community events. So, That's yeah. Nice. Very nice. tight knit community, very, um, very open. Um, but you got to, come with with what you can give you know because we have a lot of takers you know right yeah mm -hmm. i'm coming because we like raising money for like buying sewing machines we also offer like black girls designer club like sketchbooks for free like mm -hmm. the woman so we have like little trinkets but i'm like i want more for these girls mm -hmm. so i did an after school program last year for at-risk teens um oh, they were in high school and we did they made we made all their prom dresses Wow, yep. they came that every makes Thursday. me sing on the inside. Like that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah it was, it was. I loved it. I loved every piece of it. Wow. So I have a little sector called "It's um, a Success" or okay. "It's a Disaster." Okay. <laughs> so I want you to tell me about a time in your business and entrepreneurship where something went to shit, like it went to hell, but you learned something from the experience that made you, you know, change your operation or change something that you do in business, just made you a better business person, but it took you having to go through something to get to that space. Wow. Um, many, many, many things have happened on mm -hmm. this road. Um, and also understanding hustlers acumen, because you, you can understand business acumen. I went to school for business and, mm -hmm. you know, blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> hustler's acumen is a different, you, you have to have a knowledge of some type of street smart. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember producing two gowns for someone on a VH1 show. Brought it to her stylist, even though I'm I'm wardrobe styling too. But I'm like, well, You're partnering at this I'm, point. I'm mm -hmm. like, here, take this. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, up all night, sis didn't wear it ever. Still waiting, and so I said, okay, this was the deal. I do this, and then you do this. What you must understand, blacks in fashion, is that <laughs> <laughs> one hand must wash the other. Um, and I think that it's necessary for us to understand that, like, re re reciprocation is necessary for us to be able to build. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. But that was a disaster. Gotcha. Yeah. So moving forward, like, did it make you like adopt contracts, or did it make you like just maybe vetting who you work with more? Is that kind of like the lesson you learned from it? I am extremely, you know, you, I Thanks. at this point. I refuse to work with certain, like, if you're on a certain network or, oh, excuse me, if you're on a certain, um, just certain things, I just know more because you may have been burned too many times, even with certain labels, mm -hmm. you know, so it's just making sure you have a lawyer because you can adopt your contracts and they can come with like a contract, you know, and mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. So make sure you have all that in place with your LLC. You know, they have really cheap packages for stuff like that. So Don't go cheap for it. Though. No, don't go cheap yeah. for it. But, <laughs> but if, if, you, if you ain't got it and you need some type of somebody to look over something, free consultation at your... Your, um, business development centers. Yeah. That type and of another thing. one is uh, I'm gonna plug J and J Legal. That's my. I got three lawyers because I don't fuck around. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. I'm like I stick because somebody always trying to hit. They try to hit me with lawsuits. I hit them right back, honey. Really? Oh yeah, four alone this year. Last year now. Yeah. 
Never, mm-hmm. I've never lost one because I ain't never done nothing wrong. My contracts are tight. That is every insane. single client. But you know, when you're making products for people and you're mm-hmm. manufacturing and you're working with designers, the creative eye, and I always tell this, I would aspiring and mm-hmm. like new designers, just like that. If you don't go to school and you don't know the process fully, I wouldn't fully invest thousands and thousands of dollars or something when you don't know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times in my business, that's what happens. I'm making patterns and samples and I'm manufacturing and I'm manufacturing based off a design that you've given me. Mm-hmm. But you only seen it in this two dimensional form in a sketch and then it comes to life and then you don't like it. Mm-hmm. And then, but you, it's your design. It's the fabrics you he chose. You designed it. All right, I mean, it's the fabric. Not only is the design, it's the fabrics you chose. It's the fit that you approve. It's all of these things. So mm-hmm. it's just like, what on earth am I supposed to do? Am I, you, I can't give you your money back because mm-hmm. I've already now made the pattern, sewn mm-hmm. it together, mm-hmm. sourced the fabric. If you don't like it, tell me what you don't like about it. Right. How can we fix this? And then, yeah, we can fix it, but if you decide to change the design and change the fabric, I got to start over. Mm-hmm. Now you got to pay again. And that's what the issue is. <laughs> they think that because they don't like it, <laughs> I'm supposed to do it over for free. For free. And that's where the conflict is. And, oh. and I've had that situation happen multiple times. And then, then like, oh, it don't look like what I thought it was going to look like. Well, I was like, but it's all you. All I did was execute. Free. I mean, she said free, <laughs> <laughs> but all the labor was done, all the work was done, and the mm-hmm. whole thing. But that's the conflict that I felt like I constantly was running into. And then they would have some lawyer telling them that they had a case, and they never did. She did what she was supposed to do. She approved. You approved every part of this process. Mm-hmm. Like it says in the beginning, no refunds because we're, we're providing a service. So mm-hmm. my contracts have been tight. So you can't. Yeah, and I've wow. had people try to sue me in Jersey. <laughs> when they did their business in New York. So now my, my, my Jersey lawyer has to motion to dismiss over there mm-hmm. to come over here with it. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of like legalities too mm-hmm. because people think they can sue you in like their states or they'll come after you with these lengthy contracts. And they never have contracts. That's why I always make sure I'm good. So that's my biggest piece of advice, especially service-based businesses. Mm-hmm. Products, you know, y'all can just you know return it, exchange it. Service-based, when you're spending your time and you're doing something, mm-hmm. make sure your contracts is tight. Stylist, production, anything on mm-hmm. that end, protect yourself protect your neck <laughs> yep, protect your neck <laughs> protect yes. your neck okay absolutely yeah. um i i completely agree with everything she just said <laughs> <laughs> don't don't get caught out here don't get caught out here because mm-hmm. it is it can be very very challenging so can you tell me about a time just like in um shafani uh um, mm-hmm. i'm saying it right shafani 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 yes. yeah so, yeah i'm like i'm like because uh, i know you had you told me so then i had now i feel like uh, i'm saying nah. shipping them because like, i never thought of that no. so now it's like now it's in <laughs> my head so it's okay so tell me about i guess your favorite project with shafani like so far something that you worked on is like really makes you proud and really just like yo i did that um I style for the Grammys. I've had people wear me to the NAACP's. The Los Angeles Times was a big one. I had the Sunday fashion cover. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the client, I didn't know was going to give it to that client, but they wore my pants, and that was a big deal because it was right after a fashion show. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the biggest success to date, um, I had done campaigns, and, you know, thank God, right? But recently um shout out to pallet group shout out to zay um who put me on the project he was a producer we had a north public schools campaign and um it was like a back to school rev it up um shout out to uh produced by rock um one of my favorite producers in the whole wide world who uh, created this whole anthem for north public schools and it really like fired everybody up and it it made people excited to be going back to school after COVID, after all these things, all these changes that had happened in the city. Mm -hmm. And I was just really happy to be a part of that by being a wardrobe stylist on it. I worked with different children from some of the 65 um, schools in North Public School District. So having somebody call me from home, it took the cake. Like, oh, I've been to LA, I've been to Paris. No, you call me from from home? Okay. Mm -hmm. And for this, something that's going to stand the test of time because I'm sure they're going to play it over and over. It's just the anthem, right. you know? That's what's up. Congratulations mm-hmm. on Thank that. you. That's Thank what's you. up. Yeah. Like, that's like a big deal. I love, I'm out here paying these accolades. <clears throat> One more like, thing, though. Yeah. I did have, like, I've talking about the children because I just love, like, just what they're going to be, like, mm-hmm. if you pour into them. Um, but I forgot about myself and my art. Mm-hmm. Um, Homage to Mama was a short film that got into a bunch of film festivals, um, and it was a protest film that I created with Kay the Creator. 
mm-hmm. um, in 2020 where I climbed 30 feet in the air on a, a, and sat on a Columbus statue um, mm-hmm. there in the city of Newark that since has been torn down where they're going to replace it with a Harriet Tubman memorial. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, it's Harriet Tubman Christopher Square. Christopher Columbus, that's what it was? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. So I sat on top of this, this plinth um, because they had actually removed the statue to protect it. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people protested the change. They didn't want it to be renamed from Washington Square Park. And I said, you know what? I'm going to reclaim the black woman's time because at the end of the day, mitochondrially, everyone comes from a black woman. Um, and so took that and it ended up in the North Museum. So that was a really, really big deal because that was my art in purest form um, as an offering really to the ancestors. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a place where they sold slaves, enslaved mm-hmm. people, right. um, where Washington Square Park was. Um, so now it's Harriet Tubman, Tubman Square. Park. Come on, Harriet Tubman mm-hmm. Park, as it should be. I'm here for it. Anything yes. with Harriet Tubman on there, Sojourner Truth, Madam C.J. Walker, Barry McLeod, Bethune, mm-hmm. give it to me, baby, all day. Mm-hmm. Rosa Parks, all of them. Mm-hmm. I like a big black history book, especially black women. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We make Even the Aaliyah Walker. Like, mm-hmm. Aaliyah Walker was Madam C.J. Walker's um, daughter. Mm-hmm. She had, because, you know, they was like the first black millionaires and stuff like that. She had this big house that you know Mary McLeod the, the uh, Madam C.J. Walker left her mm-hmm. and she didn't have any time but she had money mm-hmm. so it was called the Black Tower and mm-hmm. it was up in Harlem and that's where Langston Hughes, yep. Zora Neale Hurston, um, Louis, Louis Armstrong yep. like that's where they got like they first start at the Black Tower so it was really dope. That's like, very true. She, and she I learned that in a black art class. Did you? Yeah like, well, when it was going because we the class was one of the class I took in when, in college was Harlem 1920s black art and literature mm-hmm. and then I had an African-American art class and that's where I learned about, about Aaliyah Walker. Lovely. Yeah. I, I studied a lot of um, Harlem's history for my 2016 show. Mm-hmm. Um, I decided not to do it in the area of New York Fashion Week Mm -hmm. the shows I decided to take it to Harlem because that's the area of the renaissance you know and so I had to study Sugar Hill heavily Mm -hmm. and that's where I had the show so it's it's wonderful to know that like Harlem and Newark has such a beautiful connection as far as history and music Mm -hmm. um jazz hip-hop like it's just a crazy connection that's so fun do you are you familiar with Harlem Fashion Week and Harlem Fashion Rock Yes, I am familiar. Um, shout out to Harlem Fashion Ladies of um, Harlem Fashion Week. Mm-hmm. Um, I was able to exhibit um, my uh, calf mono in uh, one of their exhibitions. That was last year. That was last year. Oh, I was there. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I'm like me and Yvonne and Tondra. I, I teach at their uh, Harlem Fashion Week camps and stuff, oh, and then beautiful. I do a lot of like, I've done like at least like four of their panels or whatever. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I was there. It was right next to uh, Ponte Bistro in the gallery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was late as hell, but I was there. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. Other yeah. A bunch of other black designers. I was the girl with the, the bird. Um, I call it a calf mono because it's not quite a kimono and it's not quite a calf. I remember kid. that, and, and I remember because I remember when I came in, Jerry Reeves was like right in the front, then Timothy Nash was always was also in that one. Yes, I remember. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. nice. So I've, I've seen your work in oh, person. Oh, lovely. <laughs> I'm like I've seen your work in person. Thank you so much. I so, love that piece. One of my favorite pieces is called Blackbird. Blackbird. Mm-hmm. Yes, I do. And I remember that one specifically. Oh, oh beautiful. Yes, yes. Oh, I was only six y'all in there. I think like it wasn't like like a lot. It was, like, it was drama, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Drama. Was, yeah. But I remember I saw everybody, and I'm mm-hmm. like that. And it, was you in the in the light in the left hand corner? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Like, yeah. Oh wow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I was like that piece. <laughs> that piece is. I took my team. Oh. Me and all my employees, I we took them all up there, and they all came to the gallery. Oh, that's so yeah, beautiful. Yeah, we was coming from Brooklyn, and it took us a minute to get up there. It was six of us, and yeah, we came. Thank so. you for attending. That's beautiful. But shout out to Harlem Fashion Week and shout out to Harlem Fashion Row. I love all the work that they're doing. I can't wait to um, one day partner uh, with that organization in some type of way. Yeah, Brandis and stuff. Brandis is that's the how I got the hook up with Nisa too, though, mm-hmm. because I used to do a lot of stuff with Brandis as well. Both of them. Uh, and yeah. they are lovely people when you meet them at mm-hmm. talks, and you know they they always want to help, and I, I think that's beautiful. So, mm-hmm. Brandis yeah. gave me one of my. She was it was crazy. Brandis told me. She's like, girl, you sit on the gold mine. You're going to quit your job in like six months. Oh, bless her. Like, yeah, and I was like, girl, no, I ain't. <laughs> at the time, I didn't see life. it. At the time, I didn't see it. That's and beautiful. I think I was gung ho and like being a designer. Mm-hmm. And she's like, you don't even like it that much. You like to teach. And I'm like, 
I'm like, low key, you right. Like, mm-hmm. I do. I love to teach. I love to teach sewing and pattern making and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But I'm like, me designing, and I, it's crazy because I just dropped the coat collection, though. <laughs> oh, did you? I just dropped the coat collection. It literally came out on me. Monday. I, I definitely will. Over. Yes. So I just want to end out with some of like the current fashion events. If you have mm-hmm. any that you're aware of, definitely throw them out. Um, one of the, well, actually, I got a, a couple of them. <laughs> so of course, LC Apparel Consulting is having a, a designer technical tour. We're going to ten different cities, and we'll be teaching garment construction, fabric knowledge, um, fashion history, fitting, and we're kicking off on February fourth in LA. Then we're hitting Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, Miami, Charlotte. D.C., Baltimore, Chicago, and Philadelphia. Second one um, that I must mention is the L.C. Designer Retreat. Now, the Designer Retreat is going to be lit. That is the third year anniversary of L.C. Apparel Consulting. April is also Black Fashion Month. So we're going to take a break from all of our designing and stuff like that. We're going to focus on meditation. We're going to be doing a guided meditation. We're going to be doing massages, facials, yoga. So it's a three-day event. Friday, we're going to start off with some sensual, sexy dance classes mm-hmm. and a happy hour and networking event. Saturday is going to be a full day of relaxation. And then, of course, Sunday is going to be a farewell brunch and another networking event. So hope to see you guys there. And last but not least, the LC 2023 Sewing, Pattern Making, and Draping Courses kicks off February the 2nd. So that is time for you to come with your projects, um, come with whatever you want to work on, whatever you want to learn. It is a free-for-all class, so you legit can come like, hey, I want to make this jacket and we're going to make it or I want to make this pant and we're going to teach you how to make it so uh, we believe in customized catered education and actually learning the things that you want to learn how you want to learn on your own time and of course we will be sipping and sewing the entire time <laughs> yes to the sipping yes to the sipping so um, do you have any events coming or any ones you want to recommend yes I do I have an event coming up at North Public Library you can visit npl.org um, to find out about the Black and Fashion Sewn in Excellence event. Okay. Um, we will have um, a full fashion exhibition from some of the top designers in Newark, um, or Newark, <laughs> that's how you say it. Um, and we will also be highlighting um, all the Blacks in Fashion in our city. Um, we'll have, you know, a reception, it'll be sexy. Um, come take pictures. Yes. I'll send you an invite. I come, yeah. This is going to be great, and we will have a special featured guest for our panel. Um, it will most likely be moderated by Purple. Um, so, if anybody knows about Purple in the city of Newark, she's a hip hop educator. So, we're putting all that together, and we're also commemorating um, hip hop's uh, 50th anniversary um, whilst doing so. So, come on out and. Uh, that's what I got for now. Yes, love yeah. that. I did want to answer. I saw that you had questions in here. Um, what inspired your role of accountability for our narrative as blacks in fashion? Mm-hmm. What inspired my, like, break it down for me. Because I was looking, I'm like, what do you mean? So Inspired a role of accountability. So this is definitely a role of accountability um, for our community, our people. Right. Um, you are archiving your voice not only your voice but the things that black people in fashion are doing Mm -hmm. um so you are very accountable you know um in that regard and i wanted to know what inspired you wanting to do this podcast and state random black facts and you know uplift uh black business um inspiration girl honestly I, i you know what i know exactly what it is it's funny I'm from Chicago. Mm-hmm. I've been in New York for almost 10 years. I came from a, a very, very black culture. Chicago's mass segregated. Black people live on one side of town, white mm-hmm. people live on the other side. So I've always been like black power, you know. I learned a lot about African American history and black history and stuff like that all the way through elementary school, all the way up into college. Mm-hmm. And it's just always been something that is just like so prominent to me is just like black culture, mm-hmm. black business. You know, I am one of the first business owners in my family, first to get bachelor's and master's as well um you know but I think it's because I'm I was a young black designer I was also a young black entrepreneur I started my first business when I was in eighth grade girl I I made pillows (laughs) okay (laughs) so I think that I always saw the value of 
being a black entrepreneur and being a black creative. And mm-hmm. I find that I worked in the industry for multiple years at different companies, and I was mostly the only black girl. Mm-hmm. Every position. And then when I started getting hierarchy on that scale, and I started getting into manager positions and director, I was the director of production in my last job. Very now we was like I'm only it was at first it was like at least three black girls. Yes. Now it's none. Mm-hmm. And now you're over teams Very where dominant. that you're the only black woman and then you get, you know, called off to be the aggressive black manager mm-hmm. that's and only because you're doing your job, you know, mm-hmm. inserting yourself. Mm-hmm. So I think that I just wanted to put it out there and educate and what happened was that I have a bachelor's and a master's and I have all this experience and I couldn't get a job at FIT mm-hmm. Parsons nowhere. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to teach so bad. I was like, you know what? Can't nobody stop me from teaching. Mm-hmm. Let me just start my own podcast. And I think it came across my timeline. And I was just like, I'm going to start a podcast about black being black in fashion. Mm-hmm. And like what it's like working in the industry and ways to maneuver to excel your career. Mm-hmm. But also ways of entrepreneurship because I was right in that in-between place. I've gotten really high in my career and I'm educated. But I'm also self-taught because I, I got taught by granny too. So mm-hmm. I'm self-taught and I have an education. Mm-hmm. I work corporate, but I also am an entrepreneur. So I feel like I had like the best of both worlds. Yeah. And I just wanted to share that. And I wanted to do it in the classroom, of course. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't because I just feel like well, nobody would give me a chance um, to do it. So I'm like, I'm going to do it on my own. And then from the podcast, well, I had already started LC Apparel Consulting. I started with like three or four clients. And then in 2020, Mm -hmm. I had 250 clients. I had a commercial space. I have 12 employees. And it just started booming. And all we were attracting were black designers. So Mm -hmm. we're making products for all these designers. And it was just always a thing. I only eat at black-owned restaurants. Mm -hmm. Like, I shop black designers. um, And I mostly watch black movies. Like, everything I do is in that space. Mm So I think it just comes from my roots. And it also just comes from me seeing less and less opportunities for my people and mm-hmm. wanted to present those. Wanted to give them that platform, give them that voice and not for profit so I can take that youth and get them to where I wanted to be when I was their age. LC is for the adults that are coming back and learning and mm-hmm. things that they were skipped over or they, you know, their parents told them that the creative business wasn't enough for them and they wasn't going to get, you know, make enough money. So I wanted to be able to meet a designer wherever they were mm. whether it's I just want to learn you can mm-hmm. listen to this podcast for free if you want to learn hands on you can come to the studio mm-hmm. if you want me to do service I can do that so I wanted to be able to meet people in any area they were in mm-hmm. kid adult it didn't matter man woman just That's hella beautiful. black yeah, no. <laughs> I hella love black that. so beautiful mm-hmm. I love that that we are the center of the narrative because mm-hmm. so many times you can um, be caught up in wanting to um, amalgamate Mm-hmm. and you know be yourself so I appreciate that, yeah. Thank and, that you. and that was another thing in the workplace in the corporate I found that I was able to be myself but I, it was shown because I'm who I am in my interview is the same person I am when I'm on the job mm-hmm. and I, I had a few companies where I was able to insert that in the interview mm-hmm. and they accepted me for who I was and then I had ones that didn't you know mm-hmm. so I'm like I don't convert the person you get in your interview is the same person you're going to get over here so hiring that. me and putting me in a high position is not going to turn off my blackness. And I think one time I had on a necklace, and this is when I was working in retail, and I knew it was over at that point. Mm-hmm. She told me that my a necklace was too ethnic. You know, I've, I've had those experiences, but I've mm-hmm. always been someone that's always been very outspoken in regards to how I'm made to feel. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's, it's always necessary that you know how you make me feel. Um, and so... You know, I left corporate um, a long time ago just for me to still be dealing in corporate environment, mm-hmm. but this time not as their employee, as an employee of my own company. So, um, you know, it feels different. The, right. the, it's a powerful thing that comes with you. It's a power thing that comes with you because now the table that you are sitting at, you built yourself, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, that's a mm-hmm. struggle, though. My whole staff is black, and I make sure I keep it that way, too. Mm-hmm. Like, I like it that way. Like, making sure I'm constantly giving those opportunities and internships and stuff like that when I can. Mm-hmm. Now, another one of your question was, uh, <laughs> what struggles I presented being a black podcast on a black person in this very male do- male-dominant, male Eurocentric industry? Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to say, and I... I mean, it's under it. it's under here, but I, I wear a chain that says relentless mm-hmm. um, and consistency, mm-hmm. like... Whether I had two views or I got a thousand views, I never stopped my podcast. I've been doing this for four years so I'm at beautiful. 130 episodes. And 
it's it's grown really well and I've you know been able to obtain sponsors and I also do events. I do Black Ass Friday. So you go shop black on Black Friday. So oh. I do a pop up um, mm-hmm. and that's for not just black and fashion but just black business owners. Mm-hmm. I do what I do to is a podcast to not only hear their voice but be a, a part, like be in the movement. Mm-hmm. So I have like a black designer directory on our website. Mm-hmm. We have like black designer closet sales and stuff like that. We do black ass and curate black pop ups and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So I think that having a podcast is great. You know, and being able to get it out there, but actually putting your money where your mouth is, kind of thing, mm-hmm, like, like, mm-hmm. or like, actually, what is it? Practicing what you preach, creating that platform, and creating those opportunities across the board, along with you know having the podcast. So I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm loving everything I'm hearing. So that's these are these are beautiful answers, and I appreciate um, who you are and who you will become um, to the culture. I'm trying. I'm trying to be a. I'm trying to be an icon. Yeah. No. Go London. for it. Yeah. I'm going. I'm Why going not? for legendary. I just want to be legendary. Why yeah. not? <laughs> so on that note, uh, do you just want to drop all your social handles so they know how to find you, how to get in contact with you, uh, how to work with you? Right. So go ahead and visit shafani.com. That's C H I F F A N I. dot com, or you can check me out at instagram at tiff underscore styles underscore the letter u the number two and hit me there shifani brands um on everything so yep Oh, and of you. course I'll put all of her information in the show notes as well so that way you guys can just click right there so yes. as I always say people stay black peace out and thanks for joining us <laughs>